Let's do this shit. Let's do this shit. Hi, everybody. It's the 21st of March, 2024. My name is Luke Thomas, and I know there's going to be 80 million fucking questions about MK and maybe the uh, UFC antitrust settlement as well. We'll get to all of that here on episode 196 of my live chat. Thank you so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. Um, <laughs> let's just, I mean, fucking, I'll, okay, I'll do this. I put up one um, members only video on Monday discussing the TikTok ban, and I did it from the lawn basically outside of the Washington Monument, I'm trying to show you all the DC that I know and that I love. Uh, if you're interested in doing that, you can become a member. You can get more of that. Um, so there you go. It would be greatly appreciated if you did. But all right, we got a bunch of questions to get to, so let's just fucking get to them because uh, we're just wasting time otherwise. Thank you for joining me. Let's get this party started. There we go. I hope I had that unmuted. Anyway, how you doing? Luke Thomas here. Lots to get to. Lots to get to, including the antitrust lawsuit. Lots to get to, including I know there's going to be eight fucking gazillion questions about MK. All that kind of stuff. So uh, why don't we just go and get to that? You can become a member of Luke Tom excuse me, YouTube.com slash Luke Thomas slash join. Thank you very much for everyone who has. Thanks to everyone who has reached out about it and uh, said that they like what I'm doing on there. I've got beard hair trimming still falling out because I got a cut. All right, let's fucking do this shit. Let me... <laughs> I told BC, man, I, I talked to BC about, I'm like, dude, you know, there's going to be like a fucking gazillion questions about MK today. So he actually gave me permission to give you all a little bit of news. Um, ugh, Jesus Christ. All right. Let's do this shit. Okay. Here we go. I mean... <laughs> How many of the initial questions are MK? So the first one, second one, uh, fourth one, fifth one, sixth one. <laughs> it's like, dude, the, the first 50 fucking questions are about that. Okay. All right. I mean, oh, Jesus Christ. What can I say? What can I say? All right. Let's get to some good news, such as that I can tell you any. Um, first of all, this is what I talked to BC about. I was like, BC, I got to give him something, bro. Got to give him something. So we had wanted to delay telling everyone about this until we had the full announcement coming, but there's no point in waiting anymore. So I'll tell you this much. Uh, BC and I are flying to Vegas next week. We're going on Wednesday for the... Uh, Tim Zhu, now Sebastian Fundora fight. It's supposed to be Keith Thurman. Now it's going to be Sebastian Fundora. We're going to go there, and we're going to be on press or media media row, radio row. I'm not sure what they're calling it. Uh, we'll go there that Wednesday. I don't know I don't know exactly how that's going to go for Wednesday, but we're going to be on the row Thursday and Friday for sure. Um, and then during that time, we're going to do an old-school RSD uh, while we're there as well, plus like a million interviews We'll have live broadcasts both days that we're on the row itself. So there'll be interviews. There'll be, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if we're calling them live morning combat episodes because these might go on for like many, many hours and they're just kind of from Radio Row, but it'll essentially be like an ongoing morning combat. Um, you know, there's going to be a million people there and it'll be a lot of fun. So we'll have broadcasts, live broadcasts, Thursday and Friday, tons of interviews. Um, tons of talk, tons of fun, and uh, that should be a good time. So we're going to be in Vegas next week. So you're asking, like, when are we going to get shows? Basically, you're going to get that, uh, certainly, to start. There's obviously a lot more planned, but from what I can tell you, I can definitely tell you about that. I can definitely tell you about that. So be on the lookout next week over on YouTube.com slash Morning Combat. Yours truly, Brian Campbell, out there in uh, in Las Vegas. Okay, that's the first thing I want to say. Second thing I want to say is, um, I don't know what people are imagining that Brian and I are doing every day. I mean, I appreciate the the uh, enthusiasm, and I appreciate the questions. And yes, we did in fact tell you we would be back in March. Um, it's not up. 
what what is slowing everything down has nothing to do with what is going to happen. I know it's hard to understand, but it really is true. And it's got nothing to do with me or Brian at this point. There's literally, I actually got, I'm not even supposed to tell you this. I got in trouble yesterday because I sent an email to somebody that I probably should have sent an email to begging them to move this process along. And um, I probably should have done that. Now, in the end, it didn't actually affect anything negatively. But like to tell you the level of desperation that we have, so that we can finally announce everything that's we're ready to announce like nothing about nothing about the next chapter is uncertain like that's so fucking ready to go but there's a process that we literally have to follow in order to get there and it's not up to me and Brian about how fast that goes anymore we actually um and you know oh look don't throw people under the bus i don't really give a fuck anymore we were told that timeline the timeline of like, you know, slow down in January, dark in February and back in March. That was not a timeline Brian and I came up with. That was a timeline that we were told would be an accurate one to tell you guys. So we did. So we did. And then due to factors that I literally can't do anything about, I've done everything I possibly could have to usher this process forward. Um, we're just waiting on some people to do what they're supposed to do so we can do it. And, uh, and then we can announce everything that is set to be announced. Like that whole next chapter is all set up. It's all ready to go. Like I, I can't do anything else. Let me say something too, if I can about this, if you care about Brian Campbell, and I mean this with absolute sincerity, and I'm not even doing a bit here. I know some of this is kind of like jokes and whatever. You have no fucking idea, no fucking idea what toll this process has taken on him. If you knew how he was spending his time, you would be alarmed. And I mean that sincerely. If you care about that dude, you should send him a nice message. And I'm, I, I'm not in any way exaggerating that. If you care about Brian Campbell, if you like the work that he does, if you value his presence on anything, CBS, Morning Combat, whatever, however you consume his content, you should send him a nice message. You should send him a nice message. I think nothing would would, would help him more than seeing MK fans telling him how much he's appreciated. Because um, this process has, to put it mildly, not exactly gone how we had imagined that it would. Now, the good news is, for all of the slowdowns, I, you can choose to believe this or not. It is entirely up to you. But I am telling you, again, with the utmost sincerity, the next chapter is ready to go. It's been ready to go for a while. There's another part of the process that has to be completed before we can announce that. I don't know what to do to make that part of the process go faster. We thought it would go fast during the course of February, and it just didn't. And we thought it would go faster during the beginning of this month, and it just didn't. Uh, it's moving. It's moving. But we can't do anything about that. So, um, I'm not sure what else to tell you. I'm not sure what else to tell you. So if you're saying, hey, is MK going to be back this month? That is still the plan. That is still the plan. Um, if you're asking, hey, are you guys, like, with whatever's about to happen next, is all that lined up and ready to go? Yes, it is. And I think uh, it's actually going to be great for the show. Um, certainly sitting around is not great for the show. Um, this is not how we envisioned this part of the process going either. Right? Um but I don't know what to tell you. I cannot make, I literally, <laughs> I literally cannot make it go faster than it is. And if you think that me and Brian are like happy about that or that, you know, he, you know, that, that, uh, it's not taking a toll on us, you know, uh, I don't know what to tell you. So, you know, if you care about Brian, if you care about him at all, Take 
60 seconds out of your day to send him a nice note. Whether that's on Twitter, you can DM him on, on Instagram or whatever. He loves checking all that shit. Do it. Do it. Because I think it would mean the world to him. Um, and I'm telling you, we're, we're, we're eventually going to tell you once this all shit gets cleared. And it will get cleared. Like, it's just a matter of a procedure taking place. But it will get cleared. But once it does, and we tell you how this motherfucker's been spending his time, um, you, you're going to see. The, the toll has been extraordinary on me and him both. Um, but I think especially him. So for the MK fans, the loyal ones, the faithful ones, the true ones, uh, we love you very much. We mean that sincerely. Um, when I tell you, don't worry, everything is planned. Like, like last week, I told you guys I had gotten off a call for the press release. That's true. The press release is just sitting there ready, ready to go. It's literally ready to go. Uh, but we can't release it until that shit is resolved. And if we had known that that shit was going to take as long as it has, we would have had a different plan. But here we are. So, um, or at least a different timeline anyway. The plan would have been the same either way, but the timeline would have been a little bit different. So, yeah. So, that's just what the situation is, as best I can tell you. Now, could it be? Let's see. Let's check my phone. I mean, this is what I do every fucking day. I look at my phone. Hey, is there an announcement that or a, a, a heads, a, you know, an update that I'm ready to tell the whole world about? Uh, what the fuck? No. Um, no, there's not. There's not. That's what I do I, every day. I check my fucking phone. Like, oh, did they finally clear it? You know? So, and your boy literally almost got in trouble yesterday trying to facilitate this. I literally I literally got, you know, I, I did something that was probably inadvisable. Um, but, you know, when you're trying to just be like, hey, guys, we told the public this was the timeline. We have to meet that timeline. You know, and if we don't, there's, it's not going to be good. Uh, I tried to remind the folks who are in charge of this process at this point, what's left of the process, I tried to remind them of that. Um, so any minute now, any hour now, any day now, this will get resolved. Um, but I don't know what else to do until it does. So I'm trying to keep things active. I'm trying to tell you as much as I can. We're going to be in Las Vegas next week for Zoo Thurman, or Zoo Fundora. It's going to be a lot of fun. Old school RSD, long broadcasts each day, tons of interviews. It's going to be good. But that's just where we are, folks. Okay? All right. Uh, <laughs> there's like 8 million MK questions. A breakdown on Charles versus Star can I have to go back and look. All right. Um... <laughs> This is a good one. In regards to the antitrust situation, we were promised an MK update last week. Yeah. Yeah. Luke, I got a question. Where were you in BC on the morning of January 6th, 2021? The people have waited long enough for the answer. Yeah. Uh, I was in this actual room on that day, but I know what you mean. Um, <laughs> here's another good one. These are fucking hilarious. All right. Luke, your favorite discontinued snack. Serious question. As a huge fan of the OG room service, could it see its own version and make a comeback with the return of MK? Yeah, next week. Next week, as I mentioned, we're going to do one next week. Live from the from the uh, shitholes of Vegas. It's going to be great. All right, let's do this one. Uh, Luke, how do you see a rematch between O'Malley and Jan going at this point in their careers? Perhaps in a five-rounder. Well... Uh, not that great, considering Jan just tore everything in his knee except his ACL, I believe, and is going to be out with surgery and then rehabilitation for some time after that. So, yeah, I if, I, I would say um, let's see what he looks like on the other side of that, to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about this a few times. I mean, are, are there antitrust questions? Jesus, are there any antitrust questions? Oh, here we go. Yes, a little bit later. Uh, okay. You know what? Let me just get to that one now because we'll come back to the other ones. All right. 
What do you say to the agreement between Johnson and Lee? Lee would be uh, just L-E, no two E's. It's not Kevin Lee, it's Kung Lee. Um, and Zufa, yeah. Well, there's a lot to say about it. I got to some of it yesterday on my immediate reaction. Thanks to everyone who checked that out. Um, I'd say it's mostly really bad news. Really bad news. Very, 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 very bad news. Not for everybody, not in every way. Um, I think one thing I didn't say yesterday that I would like to say today is, you know, f for the attorneys who obviously helped usher the case forward, for the plaintiffs who put their names on this and try to fight for a better future, um, and everybody else involved who was on that side of the litigation to help um, get the case to where it got. And I think a debt of gratitude is owed. Um, and I certainly would like to express my gratitude for everything they did. You know, prior to all that getting going, I did a year's worth of shows on Spike TV with Nate Quarry. I got to know him really well at that time. Nate's a stand-up guy, man. He's a very principled guy. He's, you know, a very stubborn guy, but I mean that in mostly a good way. And, you know, a hardworking guy as well who just didn't take people's shit and never really did. And so you could always understand why he was not just a part of that lawsuit. You know, he came to my studio in, in D.C. many times um, when they were on the, the when they were lobbying in Congress to get either signatories um, for any kind of Ali Act legislation. Like that guy put his money where his mouth is and, you know, he talked to talk and walked the walk. I mean, he did all of the things he said he was going to do in terms of, you know, trying to make a better future for all fighters and has really been on the front lines of those efforts in ways very few people have. And, you know, he had to get removed from the lawsuit very late. So he's not even, as I understand it, I don't know if he's even entitled to any financial compensation as a result. And even if he gets some, it won't be very much. So this is a guy that did a lot of this without any really personal reward, not much of any personal reward. In the end, I know he tried to launch his zombie cage fighter stuff after his fighting career came to an end. I don't know what the, um, I don't know where that stands, but I think a lot of gratitude is owed to all of those guys. And we should be very clear about something like one of the benefits, I say one, but like a chief benefit of the lawsuit is not so much the outcome, it's the change in the debate. I don't know if people who've been around since 2020 can appreciate this. If you've been around since 2016, you really can't appreciate this. But if you've been around since like pre or certainly even uh, or the early post stages of the Ultimate Fighter, so let's say 2005 or so, there have been raging debates about what fighters made, what they were owed, what it all was supposed to look like. And so much of it was just bullshit 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 about like oh they're gonna make close to 50 percent and you don't know how much those locker room bonuses are do you remember when the first outside the lines feature came out and dana and lorenzo put out these fiery responses about how it was all misrepresented and they weren't taken seriously josh gross I think ended up not getting sideways with ESPN, but ESPN decided to like, you know, anybody who who tries to do genuine coverage long enough in this business goes out of business, uh, which is a lesson that I really need to take seriously for myself as well. But anybody who tries to do that kind of thing long enough, you just go out of business. The business drums you out. It drums you out. And those guys stuck their neck out to help get things noticed. And certainly the the what I mean to bring it back to the lawsuit is, the lawsuit completely changed the debate about fighter pay because there is no fucking debate. Yes, there are fucking idiots on social media who will still say things like, you know, oh, they still make more than what the, what the, you think those court documents tell the whole story? There's fucking morons you're never really ever going to be able to convince. And that's just a reality of the human experience. But for anybody who reads above a fifth grade reading level, there is no fucking debate. It's over. It's fucking over. And the amount of information related to not just what the pay was, but the predatory practices as it relates to contract negotiation, as it relates to 
uh, promotional acquisition, any of those things. It laid bare all of it. All of it. We would not know that information and in the coherent way that we understand it were it not for the advancement of that lawsuit. And I've said this last week, the debate has gone from, oh, well, they definitely don't pay them that little to, okay, they pay them that little and that's actually just fine. People have had to move the goalposts and completely change how they view the situation to accommodate that. And that by itself is its own small or perhaps even large tragedy. But what we know about fighter pay and the definitive way in which we know it is a result strictly of that lawsuit. Supplementary things have been added. For example, now that Endeavor has gone public and you get some sense of the outlays, but in general, what we know about fighter pay and we know an awful lot now is because of their efforts. And that has completely destroyed any possibility of someone saying, oh, they make more than 20%. Guys, there's been years in the last 10 years, they've made 13%. And we know that because we can look at the numbers. We would not be able to do that but for the lawsuit, right? So when we talk about the $335 million, it is an extremely, that's not quite right. It is not a number that you thought would be, given what was really at risk, it's a relatively low number. But that's not the sum total of the value. Um, the value is that nobody can tell you that they pay more than 20% anymore. People can say, hey, it's good that these guys get fucked. They can, they can say, hey, it's good that they don't make much. I like it when my fighters don't make much. You'll see some psychopaths try and like, you know, launder that through some kind of twisted logic. There is that that's happening, but no one can say it's actually more than that. They have to find some kind of mental gymnastics that make it acceptable to them, but they can't actually change what we know. So we should say that about the value of the lawsuit too. It's 30, 335 million plus this like information universe that has destroyed um, much of what the early stage acolytes thought was impossibly impossible to be true. As for the number itself, there's a few different interpretations of it. Um, one is that You know, it's relatively low, but within the sort of, if you viewed it from the prism of all-time settlements in antitrust situations, um, this is a, a big win. I think that's one way to look at it. That's certainly one perspective. I think uh, the perspective that a lot of us have is that given what was stated was the goal and then what was possible, this is a paltry sum. And also you might be asking... Um, how will the money be divvied up? It turns out it's going to be pro rata, pro rata. I'm not sure you pronounce the word, but essentially it'll be uh, a function of like whatever you made during the class period, whatever proportionality that was to the broader total, um, it will mirror that. And so what does that mean? That means John Jones, Brock Lesnar, uh, Conor McGregor, Ronda Rousey, Anderson Silva, they're going to, they're going to get fucking paid. I don't know if everyone else is going to get paid. There's going to be a lot of people who don't get much hardly at all. And so this is one of the points that I would wonder about Nate. I guess we have to see exactly who gets what before we can really say. Um, but I don't know how much this is going to smaller, sort of less accomplished fighters who might actually really benefit from a financial windfall. This is going to go to people who are already basically rich. And th that's not, by the way, a tragedy by itself. I mean, one of the arguments I've made on this live chat and other ones have made as well is like, you know, Conor McGregor is the maybe the highest paid fighter in UFC history and still also the most underpaid one. Like The argument is not what did he make as an aggregate number. The argument is in terms of what you can um, economically measure that he generated did he get paid anything close to that? No, no chance. Just for the Maymac fights, excuse me, the Maymac fight alone, if he got a hundred million, they took fifty off the top. That's not a UFC fight, but that's a UFC relationship. It was that contract that dictated ultimately that sum, right? Because when you sign a UFC contract, you sign that they are your promoter in all things. Now they can get waivers for that, like you know you can. You can go and do ADCC or something. You can go do different kinds of stuff depending on what they want to let you do. But you 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 agree that they are your combat sports promoter in all facets. So, um, 
Conor McGregor has not been paid anything close to what he should have been paid by them. Ronda Rousey has not been paid anything close. Relative to other UFC fighters, she's made a lot. George St. Pierre, relative to other fighters, has made a lot. But relative to what he generated for the company? No. He deserves to be paid a lot more. So there is a certain logic um, to all of that. Again, we'll have to see exactly what that looks like in real terms once it's all handed out over the course of time. And you know, we'll, we can sort winners and losers there. Uh, but certainly, I think what you can say is relative to the expectations about injunctive relief, changing contracts uh, up to a, a billion and a half and potentially up to four and a half billion, which was really the worst, worst, worst case scenario, um, 335 doesn't seem like much. Doesn't seem like much. Um, but the bigger, I think, takeaway for me is, you know, it's sort of it's sort of poetic to a degree um, that Bloody Elbow went out of business at the same time that this whole thing has gone down. Um, dude, if you're a fighter, <laughs> you know what? I have so I've heard so many I've heard so many fighters say things like, you know, I'm not really in it for the money. I'm in it to see who's best in the world. I hope. I hope that's true. Because if you're in it for the money, you're fucked. You're super fucked. Um, you're not going to get shit. Their position, the UFC's position at the top of the food chain now, not merely unquestionable, um, short of some kind of, I'm not neither wishing this nor imagining it's real, I'm simply like theorizing, short of some kind of disaster internally, that just sends the organization plummeting to the earth um, out of nowhere. Everything that they're doing now is either going to stay the way that it's being done or get worse for the fighters. It's it's only going to get, uh, it's either going it to maintain or going to get significantly worse. There's less oversight. Um, they have gone state by state in certain cases to get any kind of pay numbers no longer transparent. The athletic athletic commissions uh, have completely fallen down on the job and failed to do basic duties in every possible way. Media can't make money doing adversarial journalism. That doesn't make money. By the way, the non-adversarial journalism barely makes anything. It's hardly a, a great alternative. But certainly going after the powers that be in a kind of way for the public to understand something doesn't, doesn't net, uh, doesn't do you any good. It will, it will ultimately kill your career. And um, the fighters at best have Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, I haven't gone around and looked and there might be some that have. I'm not suggesting that they haven't. But like the fighters get real chirpy about every and uh, any. No Boy, when it's time to bash the media, I mean, they'll get up there and I mean, you can see the Superman cape waving in the back. But when it's time to talk about the lawsuit, all of a sudden, yeah, gee, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, I wonder why. I wonder why. Um, they either have Stockholm syndrome or, in certain cases, poor financial literacy or. Um, don't, just don't care, or I, I don't know, don't have a focus on this as any kind of issue to really be concerned about. And, uh, you know, in, on some level, it might be to their benefit because focusing on it will only cause despair for them. Um, but they're like, what are the mechanisms in the industry that are protecting their welfare and their interests? And the answer is there's barely anything left. There's barely anything left. There was a period of time in MMA where there were multiple um, firms in the marketplace competing for services, and over time, one has one out, and at various points in trying to check them, uh, whether the Ali Act legislation that fell through, and by the way, if obviously if Trump were to become elected and there were to be legislation that would pass, I mean, he would obviously veto it, right? Like, he's going to veto it like that. I mean, so, you know, even even if that were to happen, it would going to be, it's, it's, it's a dead letter. Um, but the, so there's no, there's none of that. The unionization efforts, the fighters don't seem to want for reasons that remain baffling. Uh, these guys tried, the ex-fighters tried for 10 years through litigation and ultimately had to surrender to the process because our legal process is basically broken, right? They would have had to gone through, according to Nate Quarry's testimony, not testimony, but 
you know, words yesterday, they would have had to basically reintroduce legislation or sorry, reintro- re- refile the lawsuit. Um, and that would have caused another five to 10 years delay just to be right back where they are right now. And so they ultimately made a sort of a calculation about what was worth it. What could they get? And then just move on with it. But if you're asking like, what is protecting the fighter here? I mean, they're the, they're the nucleus of everything here. And what is protecting them? They won't even protect themselves. They will not protect themselves. The media is no longer capable of doing anything on their behalf of any kind of significant value for the most part, with some exception here or there. Uh, the promotions, please be fucking serious. One of the arguments that the UFC made, quite rightly, by the way, in the lawsuit was like, if you look at everyone else's contracts, they're as bad as ours. Um, That's true. In fact, ones are worse than the UFC's. So now you have all of the promotions basically adopting the the language of the dominant brand, although they're not dominant brands. Um, The sponsors, I mean, please, sponsors couldn't give a fuck less at all. The Rock pays, hey, hey, Rock, how much do you pay the fighters for wearing your shoes? Oh, right, nothing, nothing. You don't pay them a fucking dime, do you? So there's that as well. The athletic commissions, again, they do nominal kind of screening. But you had just this week. Do you see like Ben Saint Denis' fucking face before the antibiotic treatment? It looked like a, it looked like he got hit with a, it looked like he got shot through his helmet and barely survived a, a gunshot um, in wartime. And you know they let him go compete anyway. And it's just the whole thing's a mess. And they now make pay, in most cases, not transparent. Like, dude, it is so fucking weird to me to watch this moment in time, to watch all of the guardrails that protect fighters and the managers. I mean, don't even get me started on these crooks. To watch all of the guardrails for these guys, including the ones that they themselves could put into place, fall to pieces, completely implode, and then fall. To ask, like, what's next? What's next is, um, boy, I hope you like the way that it is because it won't get better for a very, very, very long time, if ever. The FTC, under a guy that Obama had appointed who had right-leaning tendencies, they took a couple looks at the UFC, said, oh, it's fine. It's amazing. What's the book? Do I have it here? Where's that book? Where's that book? Hold on one second. Ah, yes. This is not about MMA in particular. This is not about combat sports in particular. But look at this book. The Master Switch, Tim Wu. Tim Wu is a professor at Columbia and specializes in telecom, but also uh, telecom law, but, uh, but much more than that. And there's an argument he makes in this book. It's central to the book but it can be applied across any number of different industries that when there is for this book, when there is a new technology that's developed. So he go over, he covers the advent of radio and then the advent of television and the advent of all kinds of stuff. It's the same process over and over and over again. There is this explosion of creativity. There's a million firms in the market. It eventually gets whittled down to one to maybe two winners. And over time that causes all kinds of negative externalities but problems for the market litigation has to come in to break it up that does a lot of good for it and then a new technology develops and this process starts all over again you see mma is no different it's not a new technology but it's a new sport and it's the same process that has happened and every single time an entity has had the capability or the willingness or some kind of ambition about trying to rectify the imbalance. It's not about getting rid of the UFC. It's about reorganizing the balance so that there is more equitable play. They have all failed. And I'm not saying that the Nate Quarries of the world didn't try. They tried very, very hard. They put in as good of an effort as I've seen anyone put in. But in the end, they failed. They failed. Uh, They did. And we now reach a point where It's not even a question of like who's looking out for the fighter. My question is, looking around, do any of you care? Not you so much watching this. I'm sure people do. But like, do any of you people in power at any different level here 
do any of you care? The answer is no. Dude, it's not just the answer is no. The answer is a resounding no. They do not give a fuck about the nucleus of this product. The thing, the 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 thing that is at its core what makes the whole thing work. And at its core, what is most important to MMA? It's those guys in the middle. I don't exist for them. Dana White doesn't exist for them. Nobody exists for them. Oh, the UFC made them popular. Yeah, of course, to an extent. There is, there is, a, there is a mutual benefit happening. But there is nothing without them. They are the, they are the center of everything. And it, how bizarre is it that every guardrail has failed them? including the ones that they are supposed to set up for themselves. I think it's I think uh this this will be an interesting week um in the history of MMA. This will be a very very interesting week because uh I think that we're going to I mean listen, could there be future litigation and you know um uh Eric McGracken of Combat Sports Law has suggested, hey, a promoter could sue the UFC for anti-competitive practices, and we're right back here. That's true. That could happen. Um, you know, who knows with what kind of legislation could it get introduced at any kind of state or federal level, and what could happen? I don't know. I, I mean, there's there's always possibilities. But what I would say is this is a dark, dark, dark day for the entire sport. Uh, and in particular, its most vulnerable participants. And if I was running the PFL, and I was running one, dude, if anyone who is in leadership at one or PFL sees this, your fucking days are numbered. Numbered. I'm looking right at the camera. If anyone here is in leadership at PFL or one, your days are numbered. Numbered. You cannot compete in this environment. You will go out of business. Period. It is fucking curtains for you. Dead men walking if I've ever seen one before. Um, and I don't know how the... Like, if MMA is just going to be UFC and then just regional MMA, and then that's it. And you might say, well, that's fine. That's kind of like what other sports are like. Right. But with no protection, like there's no CBA, there's no union, there's no nothing. So it's like it's like all the benefits of monopoly without any of the, <laughs> without any of the guardrails. Um, I mean, who does that serve? You know, so, so, um, I'm not really sure what to tell. What to tell? I mean, I've, I've 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 gone on long enough about it at this point, but I guess just to wrap it all up, um, I am. I think MMA in the in the popular sense because I don't know how much the fan base is either in tune with this side with this news or really cares. I don't really know what the answer to that is. Um, I guess we we shall see over time. But uh, I think I think we'll look back at this week as a pivotal week where any semblance of uh, reorganization to a equitable and competitive balance was completely destroyed. And I think we should get ready for a world where, you know, we're already kind of there where the UFC can basically like, you know, Oh, ticket prices are high. I'm, I'm so mad about it. And, but like you have nowhere else to take your money in MMA. It doesn't exist. Right. Um, it's going to be that, 10x 10x you know they know that they don't ever have to worry about any other promoter and um if they can maintain positive relationships to any kind of either party by the way because remember they used to be real close with harry reed when he was uh who's a democrat from nevada they were close the ufc was close to him too like they'll they'll play the levels if they can keep the regulatory environment cool they've already turned all the athletic commissions or the vast majority of them dude (laughs) It's their industry. Top to bottom. 
It is their industry. Fucking Don Davis getting out there and being like, we're the co-leaders, dog. Co-leaders in terms of what? Walking to the grave? You wouldn't... PFL on one? I mean... <laughs> it's just such so nonsensical. And all the UFC fighters now have to sign... If you sign to be a UFC fighter, you have to sign away any opportunity to participate in a class action lawsuit. And the tolling provisions are very long. And on and on and it goes. Like, dude, it's fucking over. It's over. How I don't know how long one is going to survive. I don't know how long... PFL is going to survive. They might be able to raise capital for a significant amount of time and then hang on in some kind of zombified state. Um, but their fate is certain. Absolutely fucking certain. Last thing on this, they announced um, that it was going to be on Max, the uh, the HBO service. I'm already a Max subscriber. So like, I'm not complaining about that. I'm pretty happy. But it's like, Bellator failed on Spike. It failed on Paramount, which is rebranded to Spike. It, it wasn't on CBS Sports very long, but it didn't do all that great there. It had failed on Showtime and it didn't do shit on Paramount Plus. It's like it fails everywhere it goes. If you actually put, if I put out a, like a video about like anything UFC related, it'll get a little bit of attraction. If you put out anything, you could put out the most interesting Bellator story and no one clicks on it. Like the, the brand is completely, utterly dead. Like people aren't just going to start watching Bellator. Oh, it's on fucking Max. Like I'm just going <laughs> to, I'm just going to start watching Bellator. No, you're not. No, you're not. Like it's not going to happen at all. That's not going to happen at all. So, um, Less choice for the consumers, less choices for fans, um, less choices for fighters, less choices for everybody. That's it's the UFC's world, folks, and the rest of us are just living in it. And there might be some good parts to that, but over time, you know, most people don't have a great again without protections. Um, over time monopolies start to ossify because when you can no longer create new product, your product is what it is. All you can really do is then find ways to extract different forms of revenue from it and hollow it out. So there we are. That is in fact the end result. It's the UFC's world period. And the thing that was just last thing on this, the thing that just blows my mind about it all is like, this all seems like, Maybe there's a better way to do it. And then when you try to say that to someone, they're like, no, like, I don't want a better way to do it. And those are the first people that are going to be like in two, three years, they're going to be like, oh, I got a little burned out on MMA, you know, and I'm, I won't, I'm going to move along. And then comes the next crop and then they're going to get burned out. And then comes the next crop and then they're going to get burned out. And it's like, it's like, it's Groundhog Day every four years, man, every five years. Anyway, so there you go. Welcome. As a lifelong Habib hater, which I just don't even understand, I've come around slowly to accept the role Habib has had on MMA. Before Habib, I'd never heard of Dagestan, and yet now everyone brags about having a Dagestan wrestler in their camp. What other fighters have opened up parts of the world similar to what Habib has done? Dude, I mean, it's hard to imagine this now, but at the time, George St. Pierre had like an entire army of Canadian fighters behind him. And, you know, you can go back to it. What about Hoist Gracie and what he, it wasn't just him. There was Marco Huas. There was many, many other guys. But like what Hoist Gracie and the Gracie family did for the introduction to the world about Brazil, it's extraordinary. I mean, I'm sure in 10 years, we'll look back on the Manon Fioros and the Cyril Gons and the whoever else and like what kind of role they had. How about Michael Bisping? And at the, he was at the tip of the spear of the next wave of UK fighters. Like any kind of new market that opens up, there's always a couple of brand leaders at the beginning that have a massively influential effect, both on the current fandom and then the fighters who come behind him. Certainly, certainly he would be on that list. Did I lock my door? Yeah, because my kid is home. Do I think Conor McGregor will be fighting this summer or not? I mean, probably, probably. I do yeah coin flip I'll say yes um, just really hard to say okay good question um, Luke early thoughts on Urseg versus Pantoja obviously the champ has advantages in a lot of areas but I was curious how Urseg's boxing matches up against Pantoja's hit ability yeah I mean this one seems pretty clear to me right like as long as they're on the feet I think Urseg's going to light them up um, but that I don't think they're going to spend a ton of time there. And the other part too is like, to what extent is Pantoja shop worn 
from all these like sort of tough, long, brutal battles that he's had. That's a question I asked the last time, and it against Royville, and it didn't really seem necessarily all that relevant. But Royville doesn't have the same kind of zip and pop that I think so, and the accuracy that I think a guy like Urseg does. So it's a little bit different, but it doesn't ever seem to really affect him. And then the last thing I'd say is, obviously, if Pantoja gets on the back, it's a completely different ball game. Pantoja's wrestling is excellent. His ability to scramble is excellent. His ability to find the back is excellent. There's just a lot of things he does really, really, really well in the wrestling slash grappling department that could tie up Ursig and then force him, you know, out of his comfort zone. Also, he's got, uh, excuse me, uh, Pantoja significantly better experience in obviously UFC title fights and then. UFC five round fights more generally. He's fought much better guys over the course of his career. So there are certainly avenues to victory for Urseg, but I would say that Pantoja deserves to be the favorite. Not by a huge margin, but something has to go wrong, I think, with Pantoja, either from a strategic point or a durability or something like that. I just don't know if Urseg is really he can win. If he if he wins, it should not be surprising. Shouldn't be surprising at all. But um, Pantoja, it's his fight to lose, is what I would say. Luke, do you see yourself as a top three MMA podcast in the world? I seriously doubt it, right? I mean, fighters who bank on their existing popularity and then bring that to a, a YouTube or any other place, they're going to do much bigger numbers. I mean, whether that makes it a quality podcast is certainly up for you to decide. I'm I'm confident in the quality that I turn in, whether or not, like, from a number standpoint, I don't think so, you know. But I'm not using existing popularity that I'm just farming over from a different career. <laughs> Good question. Who will come back first, MK or Connor? I hope it's MK. I hope it's MK. Um... Here's another MK question. Yeah, these were fun. This is a great day. Okay. Different opinions on Corey versus Umar, especially since Umar appeared to look tired toward the end of that third round fight. Would a five round main or co-main event placement change your opinion on the outcome? Good question. I would say that if it's a three-round fight, I don't know if Sanhagen's got enough opportunity defensively wrestling or scrambling to keep Umar off of him. In a five-round fight, I think that equation changes substantially. Yes, it's a great question. It's a great point. In that particular way, I would favor... If it's a five-round if it's, if it's five fight, I think it's Sanhagen's fight. If it's three rounds, it's Umar's almost all by lock. Lucas, someone who has been equally enamored with Taporia's superstar ascension following his KO victory over Volk, can you speak to just how unique what we're witnessing with him is? I've been watching the sport for 20 years or so now and have never seen anything like it. Like, excuse me, like the way that Spain and Georgia have galvanized around him. Ireland rallying around Connor and Canada doing the same for GSP during their respective rises to superstardom seem like the only slightly similar experiences to what you're seeing with Ilya currently, but even the support they've received feels like pales in comparison. Well, it's kind of different. Connor was really big. Connor was really, really big. And Connor was big before Toporia was big. Toporia was like kind of rising and then beating Volk kind of exploded. Whereas there was this like, with Connor, remember, what was his fight with? His fight with uh, Holloway was very, very early into his run. And by the time that happened, they were already lowering the lights for him, right? So there was this rolling boil that was already happening. He got injured, had to come back, blah, blah, blah. But um, he also was antagonizing half the roster and there was people sent out to beat him and then he was mowing through them. You know, that one just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas Taporia would kind of like was ascending and then exploded in an instant. The difference is that like Connor had the streets, so to speak, right? Like the Irish public, I guess they have since kind of halfway soured on him now. I'm, I'm not exactly sure how they view him, but certainly it's not 100% favorable, that's for sure. Um, but early into his rise, and again, he was a double champ coming off of Cage Warriors that also boosted his profile and his interest in him and everything else like that. That was not exactly what Taporia had. Taporia came in very kind of quietly, but the difference is Taporia was meeting with the fucking head of state. You know what I mean? He was meeting with the goddamn, I don't think he met the king of Spain, which I don't know. Oh, Jesus Christ, my kid's crying over there. Um, but he met with the prime minister and 
the mayor of Madrid and like right after getting the belt, like this completely tr- like Cinderella at the ball kind of a thing that I've never exactly seen. I've seen these slow, but like really, you know, very visible accumulations into this gigantic thing. And GSP was not exactly that. Although also, you know, GSP was fighting Jay Huron and Dave Strasser in a completely different era. So there's, it's just hard to make it the same kind of thing. You know, also when GSP got like a Gatorade commercial, it's like, oh my God, a UFC fighter got a Gatorade commercial. How awesome is that? Like that's unheard of. You know, that kind of thing was happening. So I, that one is a little harder to say, but I will say Teporia's ascension in the way Spain has embraced him. And then again, getting Real Madrid to embrace him is like completely unlike anything I've seen. But Connor was more popular and building a phenomenon much earlier in his run so that by the time he became champion, it was, you know, this enormous event. It was almost like, I mean, I'm sure to the Irish, it was like an expected crowning. Remember, they did a world tour uh, just to promote that Jose Aldo fight. Like, that was a big thing, whereas, you know, 298 was promoted well and Volk did his part to promote it, but they didn't do a world tour. And people were like, oh, Teporia... He couldn't do sketch comedy at the uh, at the uh, press conference. He must not be that good of a fighter. And then, of course, he goes out there and ices him. But, you know, d- different topic. All right. If your work and job was not an option tomorrow, what field of work could you see yourself having to go into? Probably pornography. Are you experienced in any other fields? N- I mean, not to really matter, no. I mean, if this all fell apart tomorrow, and Lord knows with the way things are turning out, it certainly could. Um I'm kidding. But uh, PR, I guess, something like that. I don't know. I mean, I don't really. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Uh, okay, let's add, let's get to this one. Luke, word on the street is that Alex Pereira had a line added to his contract to potentially allow him to turn around and fight at 301 if he comes out of the fight relatively unscathed. Uh, setting aside how difficult that would be to do, And by the way, the commission gets a say in that too, right? I mean, it's not just his or the UFC say. Granted, commissions don't really do their job very well, but there is, you know, some level of uh, oversight they have as well. Who would you think he even fights? Is he Jan or Rakic? I doubt, well, Rakic is fighting at 300, so I doubt it's him. I doubt Ankalaev is going to be ready for, uh, after Ramadan. Thanks for everything you do. We appreciate the hell of you. I appreciate you guys too, man. I really do. So, I mean, just look at the roster. I'm not even fucking sure who the answer would be. Let me see here. So, you've got Jamal Hill, who is fighting at 300, right? Um, Yeah, I I guess Rakic fighting at 300 if he came out of it unscathed. But then again, there's also Yuri. If the winner of that came out of it unscathed, I guess you could do that. But that's you have to have not one but two guys from the same card who would both have to win and both be unscathed. Possible happens a little sketch uh and then after that it's it's again yuri who's fighting on the card on Kalayev, to your point about ramadan then Jan, i don't know if he's ready or not i think he had a health issue right rocket is on the card then krilov but like are we just going to do like a krilov title fight out of nowhere johnny walker i guess you could do that since it's brazil but again we're going to do that given his recent performances khalil roundtree i guess you could do that i mean you could do some of these they just become almost nonsensical at a certain point Oh, I can see my kids crying because she didn't nap. Guarantee it. Guarantee it. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, with the UFC almost ready to start a new TV deal and Netflix entering the space, who do you think is the most likely platform and would any TV or streaming deal benefit the fighters and not just swell Uncle Dana's pocket? I mean, guys, let me, let, 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 let's back up a step. Would any deal benefit the fighters? Guys, this is not even a relevant question anymore. It's not even a relevant question anymore. Hey, is this good for the fighters? I'm not saying that um, a normal person wouldn't ask that as like a reflexive kind of concern. What I'm telling you is the way the industry works now, is it good for the fighters is the least relevant consideration imaginable. And the fighters have participated in the diminishment of that question. Is it good for the fighters? My response would be, not that I don't care, 
but asking around the industry, does anybody else care? And the resounding answer is uh, not just merely a no, but a hostile no, a fuck no, a Zion Williamson at Duke dunking, you know, alley-oop no. People asking this like there's anything coming down the, well, maybe there's a sponsor who's coming who will pay, no. Oh, maybe the next broadcast, no. Hey, maybe this, no, no, no. The entire industry runs the way that it does because it fucks the fighters. And again, it's a mind fuck. It's a total mind fuck, but the fighters themselves had participated in that diminishment. It's hard to understand. I get it. I like it's it's kind of weird to say, but it's the reality. Whatever we discuss about the next streaming deal, it's not even worth bringing up what does it mean for the fight? It doesn't mean fuck all. <laughs> That's not the way this business works anymore. Over. Over. Done with. You can crumple that one up. Throw it out. Not relevant. Not fucking relevant. The only thing you could ask is for uh, as relevant would be the very, very basic, basic, basic job. The minimal shitty ass oversight that any particular one commission might provide time to time. That's it. And by the way, we'll see about that just on the boxing side. Like, is New York State going to give Ryan Garcia a, a you know, are they going to license him to compete? Oh, boy, that's a fun little story, right? I mean, I bet that they do. I bet that they fucking do. You know what I mean? Like they're they get a little bit they get a little bit froggy, so that one's that one's a little bit more debatable to me. But like in the MMA industry, <laughs> hey, is this good for the fighters? The answer is no. Like, oh well, this one improved. No. Well, wait about it. No, no. And you know who helped make it that way? At least a little bit, the fighters themselves. It's uh. It's a mind fuck, but it's where we are. It is where we are. So you're asking, with the T with the UFC almost ready to start a new TV deal and Netflix entering the space, who do you think is the most likely platform? Probably staying with ESPN, but Netflix would be a game changer for the UFC brand. I can tell you that it would be a monster change for the for the UFC brand. Uh, and, and would any TV streaming will benefit the fighters? I mean, just I mean, get the fuck out of here with that. And not just, well, Uncle Daniel's... I mean, yeah, no. That question's irrelevant. Like, absolutely not relevant at all anymore. None. None at all. None. So you, you, must, you, you should... And I mean this seriously. You should stop asking questions like that. Have I heard estimates for how much people illegally stream uh, UFC and boxing pay-per-views? Yes, but they're outdated. I haven't heard one since like 2011 or 2012. I don't, I mean, I would imagine the numbers are significantly different by now. I am 25 and 0% of my friends who watch buy pay-per-views. <laughs> Damn, y'all are some thieves. Does the UFC actually know how many people total watch? They have probably figures, they have estimates in that sense. It used to be, and this was again, a very different model. It used to be a pay-per-view purchase was good for 10 people on average, but I don't know what that number is today. It's obviously very different. Um, again, more questions about MK and why has MK been sidelined? It's not sidelined guys. It's re It's like, I'm ready to pull the trigger on it. I just need the, the, the range safety officer to tell me that the range is open. That's it. You know, <laughs> has MK not started yet because BC is recovering from multiple STIs. <laughs> you mean STDs? Uh, let's see anything else here. Oh, fucking hell. Luke, in your opinion, why does the UFC continue tough or are they obligated by ESPN? Um, they probably have a deal, a content deal, that requires a certain amount of programming. It's cheap and easy to produce. They know how to do it. They've done it a million times. They understand what it takes, what it doesn't. Um, and so, you know, there is still at least nominal value to it. And so it continues. But, like, short of that, like, no, it has no value. All right. Let's see what you got. If uh, the donations work for you, if if not, I didn't even mention it at the top because I knew just what kind of a shit show was going to be for me today. So let's just see how this goes. All right. Uh, and thank you to everyone who watches, whether you 
subscribe or you don't, whether you like this video or you don't, whether you leave a donation or you don't, whether you're a member, whether you're not, I appreciate all of you. Luke, what's the most unique injury sustained from an MMA fight? That one that um, uh, MVP hit on Goichi Yamauchi that seemed to like break his kneecap. You guys remember this one? Let me see if I have a picture of that one. Well, that's, that shit was no, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure there's a good picture of it. This one. Oh, here we go. This one. This joint right there. See that? When he just kicked it and it kind of like went in. That's a bad one. MVP has been on the the the, the handing out end of um really gnarly ones. Like when he fucked up Cyborg and he broke the front. I mean the the injury that um Sage Northcutt suffered at the hands of Cosmo Alexandre was a bad one. Cyborg Santos when he fought MVP was another nasty one. There's been some nasty ones, man. What kind of precedents are set by the settlement? From antitrust, I don't think it changes anything one way or the other. You know. Thoughts on civilians saluting coverless indoors? I mean, let the donks do what they're going to do. I mean, just so long as you're not a uniformed military personnel and you're saluting without a cover, you know, that kind of thing. Lots of respect, respect for Nate Quarry. Why did he settle? Yeah, I mean, he, they kind of outlined the logic. It was that or 10 more years of uncertain litigation, you know? So they went with what they went with. Thoughts on Max Kellerman as a boxing commentator? I love Max. I would really love to have Max's career, which is being let go from ESPN to the tune of millions of dollars and then just disappearing from the earth for however long. Have you guys noticed Like since he got let go, no one's heard from him? He hasn't tweeted. There's been no interviews. He hasn't done any podcasts. He then done fuck all. He just is sitting on his money, fucking about whatever, however he's spending his days. And uh, God bless him for it, dude. I wish I could do the same. Again, uh, aging but very skilled vets getting head kick KO'd like Edgar, Ferguson, Cruz, Usman, Volk, Poirier. Reflexes or just their boxing? I mean, it's a little bit different to each one to each one. So, I don't think Usman's was a reflex issue. It was just a focus issue in a fight. Edgar's, I think, was a reflex issue. Volk, I think, was a, a preparedness issue. Poirier was a surprise issue. Um... But yes, certainly age will diminish focus, it will diminish resistance, it will diminish reflexes, any of those things. Luke, I saw your tweet the other day about the new LeBron JJ pod. If you could pick two MMA fighters, active or retired, to do X's and O style podcast, who would it be? Great question. Have you guys seen this? JJ Reddick is doing a podcast with LeBron James, and all they're doing is talking about like X's and O's and like technique theory. It's fucking brilliant, man. Um, I'm not even like a LeBron guy at all, but like, obviously one of the, if not the very best, one of the very best players to ever do it. If he's talking about the game itself. I would imagine on that level, he'll have some wisdom. Um, someone made an analogy to me. It would be kind of like someone, I didn't, I didn't come up with this, but and this is not quite your question, but the analogy that was made to me was the MMA equivalent of this would be like Paul Felder and John Jones getting together. Um, to answer the question, I would say something like Corey Sandhagen and, you know, GSP or 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 Habib, something like, I mean, Habib's English is, is going to get in the way, but if they're talking about technique theory, yeah, something like that, something like that. But I, there could be better. I mean, Corey Sandhagen, you could pick. Ryan Hall, you could pick. That's sort of like the JJ role. Who fills the LeBron role? That one's a little harder. If Rackets were to emphatically beat uh, Yuri at UFC 300, does he deserve the winner of Poton Hill? I'd be okay with it. I don't know that... Yeah, I guess emphatically, yes. If it's emphatically, I'd be okay with it. Yes. Yes. And thank you for the donation. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, welcome to the team, Mr. Brass. Mr. Brass. What do you think the sentiment will be towards Dana posthumously? Everyone seems to stand hard for him now, but I get the Joe Paterno vibe. <laughs> okay. Well, hold on. I mean, I've been critical of Dana, but I'm not going to that place. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I think he'll be remembered relatively fondly. I mean, most people who have issues with him end up leaving the sport so that the people who will memorialize or potentially eulogize him, whatever, 
there'll be people who either benefited from the system or have fond memories. Um, so yeah, I think that they'll say really nice things. Thank you, sir. Welcome to the party. Joe, thank you very much. Art, thank you very much. Uh, this gentleman whose name I can't pronounce says, will LT and BC be in Texas covering the Paul Tyson fight? Extremely unlikely, but I don't know. We haven't even talked about it. First combat sports event by Netflix seems worthy. Seems very worthy. I just don't know if we're going to travel to that one yet. I mean, we guys, we have a lot to like get going first before I can tell you what's happening in August in Texas. Like, let's get through next week and then we can make some plans. Okay. Uh, okay. Question for Luke. Any book recommendations related to U.S. foreign policy after World War II during the Cold War? There's one on Afghanistan I've read. It's called Ghost War. Um, Ghost Wars. Shit, I can't remember the title at this point. It's been a while since I read it. Um, but that de dealt with Afghanistan during the Cold War. It's worth your time. Mostly as it relates to the Russians, but still. So MK is like a legit media outlet that is respected. Like the Nelk Boys? I don't know about that. But you guys are getting press credentials using the MK brand? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know you are a big Star Wars fan. Have you seen the ratio of likes to dislikes for Acolyte? I did hear about that, yes. I've never seen anything like it. Right now, it's like 156 likes to 279,000 dislikes. So, I mean, here's my thing. I would have given it a dislike. Okay. I, I'm going to be clear. I don't know the full extent of the complaints. One of the complaints I have seen has been that like, oh, there's like black people and women in this, and then we hate that, which I don't understand what the fuck that's all about. I never really will. There might be other creative ones that I don't know about. So like, sheath your lightsaber, nerds. I don't know. But if that's the sole total of it, it's like, why are these women fucking Jedi? I mean, just fucking put it away. But I did see that there was another one where I guess there were some inconsistencies since no one had apparently seen a Sith before the Phantom Menace in like 10,000 years or some shit. And now here's one that they must have seen or whatever. And so how does that square with the canon of the movies? If that's a complaint, I guess, then that's when I mean, we have to see how they resolve it. But if that's a complaint, then, you know, I guess that would be legitimate. Um, my complaint is, aren't you fucking nerds sick of the Jedis? It's like, dude, the, 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 the Star Wars universe can't expand. I mean, I guess we're done with the Skywalkers and the fucking Palpatines. God, that was the, the, I mean, the rise of Skywalker. Literally, I would rather, in the words of Patton Oswalt, I would rather get fucked to death by an eight-dicked walrus than sit through that again. I mean, really, that was truly the worst movie I've, uh, I've ever seen. But, like, the real criticism, if I can just be serious for a moment, of that movie, of the series generally, is that they can't graduate beyond this shit. And so, part of the reason why The Mandalorian was kind of interesting was that it was some, or at least for to some extent... It was a departure from that, although here comes Grogu, and then you see Luke Skywalker, and they just brought... Dude, they can't they can't do Star Wars without the fucking Jedis. They can't fucking do it. And I guess you got Rogue One, which was Jedi adjacent, because they had the, the kyber crystal donks who were blind guarding the temple, but even then, that's part of it. And then Darth Vader's in there slashing motherfuckers to death, which is a cool scene, but this is just what I'm saying. You can't have a fucking Star Wars universe without going right back to the fucking Jedi's and the younglings and all this shit and the Seth, the Sith. And the, it's like, dude, is there any other story to tell for the love of God? And then they got a Wookiee with a man bun. I was like, dude, you know, what are we doing here, fellas? What are we doing here? But if your complaint is that like, oh, there's women and black people in this, then you're a fucking loser, you know? Luke, you have mentioned having foot issues in the past. Have you tried zero drop? Holy shit, motherfucker. Are you, are you new here? <laughs> Zero drop wide toe box shoes. They have completely strengthened my feet and calves after just three months of wearing them. My guy, I've been wearing them for three years. So I'll take these off. These are the ones I have on my feet now. These are a little bit weathered. These don't look like it, but these are lems. See that lems? Do I have my other ones here? Yeah, hang on. You know what? Since you asked. Since you asked. Hang on. All right. Do I wear wide toe box zero drop shoes? It's the only thing I wear. Here's another pair of limbs. Wide toe box. See how the, the, the toe box, where the toes go, is shaped like a foot, not just a narrow arrow? There's one. Here is the, these are feel grounds. This is the, um, these are the court shoes. 
right? These are the field grounds. That's a brand you can get in Germany. Here is my Vivo shoes. I forget the model of this one. This is another one that I wear typically when I do any kind of lifting outside, hence all the dirt that's on them right here. Here are my Vivos that I get also for lifting. There's another one, wide toe box, zero drop, just like that. Here's another one that I wear. These are also for lifting. These are my Vivos that I wear in the summer because these ones are super thin. You can see right through them, just like that. And I have a gazillion more. My guy, I've been wearing them for three years. For three years. I also have a cork board that I do 10 minutes a day on to open up my toes. It has done wonders for me, but the problem that I have on my left toe is so bad that it still hasn't fixed it. It's fixed a lot of other things and it's been great, but it hasn't fixed that. Dude, that's all I wear. And I used to wear Jordans and all that shit and I had to give it up for foot comfort. Dude, I can you see my feet? Look at my feet, bitch. Can you see? You see that? I don't wear socks that don't have t individual toe place placements in it. How about that? I don't wear any socks that just have a one, like, you know, it's just a, just put your, you know, your foot in and it's just one big opening. No, no, it has to have individual toes because actually people don't realize this socks can constrict the feet as well. So yeah, do I wear them? My guy, it's all I wear. All right. Personally. Okay. That's great. <laughs> and broken promises. Jesus. I know you and autistic Brian. Okay. It's a little mean are doing your best. I mean, we truly are. Thank you, Dale. That's, a really hurtful, but also uplifting message. Does Brian have a personal YouTube account? No, he does not. Not yet, anyway, certainly. Favorite short story or any that come to mind that you'd recommend? Fiction. I'm not the guy to go to on fiction, unfortunately. I wish I had a better answer for you, but no. CBS. CBS? Partnered with USADA. Six-month testing pool for MK2.0, Delta 8s, and Applebee's Whippets. Are slowing it down. <laughs> I wish that was the reason. Fucking A, I wish that was the reason. Jesus Christ, I wish that was the reason. Uh, PFL should just pull all, put all their chips in and sue in the same way Epic did versus Apple to force the courts to decide. Seems the only way they could survive. That is true. If they think they're going to go out there and compete, I don't think they are. I, I think what currently the guys who are using it for are, are in leadership positions, they're going to sell it and then just move on. I, 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 there's no other path. You either sue the UFC and fight to change the industry or you just sell what you've got and leave it. That's it. There's no, there's nothing in between. I have faith in MK. Now MK tech support, not so much. Fair. Fair. Very fair. Very fair. Luke, can you give us your picks for the UFC 300 main card and maybe the prelims? I will do that at a subsequent date. I will do that. I promise. Uh, look at this. Lydian, 84. Giving away five LT memberships. Go get them while you can. Member question. Outside of a fighter lawsuit, is there a mechanism which the SEC can investigate the monopoly practices? Uh, there are ways to get regulatory oversight from the Federal Trade Commission, yes. Um, I don't know about the SEC or not, but um, the FTC has looked at it a couple times and then passed, but that doesn't mean they couldn't look at it in the future. By the way, you know, Anyone, it's funny, people are always like, oh, Luke likes Biden. I'm like, anybody who watches my live chat knows that that's affirmatively not true. I can't stand him. Uh, but if there is one area where I could give the administration at a bare minimum uh, two thumbs up, and I'm not the only one, how about MAGA Senator from, I think, Ohio, J.D. Vance. J.D. Vance is a Republican senator from Ohio, super MAGA, hardcore. And even he had literally said, I think, either this, no, not this week, he said it like two weeks ago, that the only good thing about the Biden administration was Lena Khan, um, who basically heads up the all of their antitrust efforts. And uh, they sued Apple today. Dude, they're going after motherfuckers. Um, that part I'm okay with. That part I'm okay with. But, like, I don't think the UFC is a big target for them. Uh, at least not right now. What are your thoughts on, oh, there we go, USDOJ uh, suing Apple and accusing the tech, well, I guess, it, yeah, um, accusing the tech giant of maintaining a monopoly over the smartphone market. I mean, listen, it's going to go to trial, and I don't have even the slightest idea how it's all going to play out, but I can tell you, as someone who went from an Android to an Apple phone, 
when they say that the watch doesn't work as well from one phone to the next, they're telling the truth. Obviously, they're getting to this idea about the blue versus the green uh, bubbles and everything else in between. Um, and, you know, if you ever have bought, like I had a Google Pixel, whatever it was before I switched, and I had Samsung phones. I had a Samsung, whatever it was, 21 or something like that. I think that's right around when I switched, 21 or so, 22. Uh, Google products work much better on a Samsung than they do on Apple. Like if you have Gmail on your iPhone, you have no idea how, or, or any, any of those apps, they work significantly better on an Android. And I don't think people really fully understand that. Hope you're doing well. Uh, question, what is your opinion on the death? Jesus. Uh, I am, I've had changing opinions over time. Uh, I would say right now I'm uh, affirmatively against it. Thoughts on referees that stop the fight when a fighter is showboating. Did you see Ben Whitaker versus Khalid? You mean, oh, you mean the, the boxer? Yeah, I mean, I don't mind it. Uh, no, sorry. I, I do mind it when the referees get involved. I don't mind the showboating. I think the showboating is actually pretty cool. Uh, what do you think changed between the mandatory settlement meeting and the actual settlement? Hard to imagine Zupa had an offer that was much lower than what was eventually agreed upon. It's it's too hard to speculate. I don't know. I don't know. You know, again, in the next 45 to 60 days, both sides will submit. I mean, we got the securities document, but we'll get the rest of everything. And then they'll be free to talk on the record. And I guess we'll get more information at that time. But I, I would be speculating. I don't, I don't know. Um, I did have someone, you know, uh, who was an attorney tell me that, and by the way, I, 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 another person who was an attorney say something not exactly the same, but pretty similar. That like part of the reason why they might have settled is because not only were the attorneys set to make you know a fortune on this anywhere between you know fifty to a hundred million, but probably closer to a hundred. Is um, although I, I'm guessing on that, I, I don't know. I want to be clear about that, but um, um. The law firm could have been one of these entities that, you know, look, they did the work in earnest. Again, because of the lawsuit, look at what kind of information that we have. But at the same time, uh, the entire effort was basically premised on an eventual payday anyway. Like, did they really have in mind changing the MMA industry? Probably not. Right? Not, not, the, not, the, not the Nate Corys of the world, but the attorneys. You know what I mean? And the, the, there is a world which you can imagine the attorneys were like, hey, you know, we've taken this as far as we can. Any further is completely uh, unnecessary and risky. Let's get what we can get out of this process. Took 10 years to get there, an enormous amount of money, and then just move on. Uh, that seems like a very plausible scenario as well. The acting in Roadhouse was better than Django. I don't believe that, but we'll see. If you had to pick three MMA fighters to be a part of your debate team, who would you... Oh, Jesus. Um, Corey Sanhagen, Ryan Hall, and Steve Ursig. <laughs> Someone in the comments was like, Luke likes all the nerds. Yeah, those are the ones who are thinking the things through. It's the nerds who solve all the world's problems, fuckos. Just so everyone knows that. Right? Uh, DOJ sued Apple for monopolistic practices today. Yeah, they sure fucking did. Uh, some of your favorite defying all odds moments in the UFC, i.e. Congo Berry, Alex escaping Brian's mounted guillotine, headshot dead. Defying all odds moments. That'd be one. Uh, Pete Sell and um, he who got hit with the... Uh, fuck, who was the guy he was fighting? Jesus Christ, he fought Kung Lee too. Scott Smith. Pete Spell and, and Scott Smith is a good one. Or he gets hit and then bends over and then and then as Pete Spell's running in, he fucking tags him. That was a great one. Um, even just overall, the performance that Holly Holm put in against Ronda Rousey was just like, you know, those are two great ones. Uh, riding off your sentiment towards Indonesia spearheading martial arts movies, would you agree that Korea has the horror thriller movie genre locked? Yes. Dude, Korean horror is like horror you've never seen before. Both in terms of the gore level, but also like the depth that they put into the movie itself. It's it's quite unusual. How U.S. courts allow the U.S. to be a monopsony. Fighters are independent contractors. You are treated like employees without the benefits is insane. 
Well, they weren't suing to be employees. They were just suing, alleging that they had used the UFC had used anti-competitive practices to suppress wages. And then we ended up here. I don't understand why PFL and Bellator has not merged into one company. So I heard something from a, a source that as part of the arrangement to take on Bellator, it had to stay on television or it has to be broadcast independently for a year. Um, I guess we'll see how true that is, but I'm hoping that when the year is up that they just fold it in because the brand is fucking dead. Um, look, I was surprised to hear you aren't a huge brand. I'm not a hater. Her policies include expanding the definition of employee so more workers can unionize. I, I, listen, let me be clear about something, Steve. It's a good question. I'm not in any way opposed to her. Um, I mean, I have seen stuff about embracing of spiritualism that is not doesn't really resonate with me. But if you went down the line and sort of like identified her policies and to what extent they would mirror things that I think the government could do to meaningfully improve people's lives, there probably is significant overlap. I guess I would say as a candidate, I was not necessarily inspired. Will you ask John Nash, will the UFC pay from their own capital or will the settlement be covered under some sort of business liability insurance? I will ask. It's a great question. Tax deductible, though. Tax deductible. Uh, Dari Mike says, it's disheartening to see how few people, the UFC, other promoters, managers, the fighters, and even the fans on this live chat care about the suit. I respect these fighters so much, but this is bleak. Um, it is bleak, but it's, I think, a painful lesson in the way of the world these days. Um, people don't give a fuck. Why are there many boxing fans and journalists on Twitter wanting PBC to go downhill? Just weird ass. It is fucking weird behavior. I'm like, listen, man. PBC does good stuff. PBC does bad stuff. Matrim does good stuff. Matrim does bad stuff. Golden Boy does good stuff. Golden Boy does bad stuff. And I'm not saying it all in equal proportion or that you have to like them all equally, but PBC has gets these weird motherfuckers, dude, who come out of the woodwork proclaiming all different kinds of things are going to happen, all of which turn out to be either, either completely wrong or at a bare minimum mostly wrong. And... It just continues. I don't quite get if they're like anti Al Heyman or something. I don't really understand it either fully, other than there's like weird territorialism about the whole thing. But yeah, dude, boxing Twitter, dude, you think MMA Twitter runs on rumors? No, boxing Twitter runs on rumors, dude, in a way you can't even imagine. Walt Big Ticket Harris suspended for PEDs for four, for four years. Had to say, but it seems like his career is over. Any thoughts? So he tested positive. If you look at the write-up, he tested positive in both June and July. And then they wanted to do like a follow-up retesting. And he tested for different steroids, again, according to the write-up, in August. <laughs> They're like, yeah, you're fucking done. Like, uh, it's it's a wrap for him. You know, it's, his career is effectively over. I mean, he, maybe he can go to Russia or something where there's no athletic commission. But uh, nice guy. Talked to him a couple times, but it's over. Real quick, for everyone on the MK Discord server, we're doing a BC appreciation thing. Nothing big, but get in there and say something nice, and I will make sure he gets it. Guys, I talk to BC every day. I'm not going to go to the Discord and say something nice, but I'll say something here. And by the way, shout out to all the folks in the Discord. BC has a heart of gold, and I said at the beginning of this thing, and I'm going to say it now. If you're somebody who likes BC, do yourself a fucking solid and send him a nice message. When I tell you it would mean the world to him, it would mean the world to him. You follow March Madness. This might be the first year in since I was, I don't even know where I'm not following at all. Dude, college basketball sucks. <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, I get that it's popular. You know what I mean? I get that. And I get that I, I watch stupid shit, you know, and then March Madness is cooler. And there's more people who like that than like what I like. I totally understand that. I just, um, dude, when I was a senior in high school, it was Jason Williams. Dunleavy, Battier, Boozer, and whoever else on the Duke starting lineup. Like, college basketball is not that anymore. Like, it's not even close to that. So it's just not as interesting to me. Do you think Canelo is ducking David? I mean, I just, I'll say this. Like, you can decide whether he's ducking him. Not a single thing he has said defends the reason to not take the Benavidez fight. Nothing. Oh, it was 150, 200 million. Oh, he's dropping hints to the Saudis. Even then, it doesn't make sense. Oh, he, he brings nothing more than 25 pounds on fight night. Guy, you had a fucking title at cruiser or at uh, at, at light heavy. You fought like I, I just it, you fought Bivol there. You fought. I, it just doesn't even make. It just doesn't make any sense. Like nothing he's saying makes any sense 
as it relates to like why aren't you fighting Benavidez? You know, I'm not. I like the Mungia fight. I'm cool with the Mungia fight. I'm cool with the Mungia fight. But like the stated reason for not fighting, like you know why he's not fighting. I mean, actually, I, I don't know. That's why I got to back up. I don't know. But none of his answers make sense. Did the plaintiffs in the antitrust suit sell out? What's the difference between the fighters settling the lawsuit and the UFC essentially giving TJ Cowboy Kane and GSP new deals to leave the MMA FA? Um, I guess we'll have to see in the end what the court documents finally say. I mean, I would say that five guys getting money is different than a $335 million lawsuit. But if you're asking, did either of those efforts meaningfully change the industry in any kind of way that would benefit anyone other than themselves? So far, the answer appears to be no. Favorite MMA play-by-play or color commentator that you always felt was underappreciated? Laura Sanko. Also, the members' only vids have been clustered during the MK break. Cheap plug. There you go. Get on them, boys and girls. They don't go on TikTok. They don't go on IG. They go one place. Members only. Any plans to watch Roadhouse? I was going to watch it today, but um, golly, man, I fucked up my rotator cuff benching, which must have meant they were like I was too internally rotated and not too far out, but I fucked up my sh- this part of my shoulder. Like I can't. Oh, that hurts. So it's all jacked up. So um, I had to do some other shit around the house today. I, I couldn't. I want to like, you would have thought I would have had time to like rest up. But I wanted to kind of move around, but I couldn't. It's a whole thing. I just couldn't get around to it. But I'm going to watch it. Carlos says, you should be incredibly proud of your coverage. You've done it at the expense of your own reach. Yeah, fucking tell me about it. You made a decision not to pan it to others. You might not have the reach you'd like, but the virtue is its own reward. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, Carlos, I can't go to the bank and say, hey, um, can we use this virtue to uh, pay my mortgage? Because they don't give a fuck. But I appreciate the sentiment just the same. Uh, okay, fighters don't unionize because some tried, got pushed out with ach- uh, achieving anything. Remember Leslie Smith and Spearhead? The core of the problem is that 90% just want the UFC and nothing else. Yeah, but she took it a little bit further. I'm not like condemning her in any way. I thought she was incredibly brave, but she took it a little bit further than normal. They wouldn't need a high threshold in order to get unionized. It's actually quite achievable, um, but they had some concerns, fighters that I talked to, that there'd be retaliation. And, um, so they just wouldn't sign. So, but I mean, no one can do it, but them, like you can't do it for them. I was going to buy a UFC pay-per-view once, but my boss didn't give me my win bonus. (laughs) Perry versus Alves. How bloody will it get? Dude, that's going to be a bloodbath. Those two are going to fucking kill each other. Going to be a lot of fun. Have you seen Justin Gaethje's YouTube? I have not. Channel, he posts these high quality episodes during his camps. The best content I've seen for any athlete. Sweet. Pre-roll on me, homie. Much love. Thank you. Apoplectic Spock. That's a great name. Uh, can't wait for the new MK Reboot. Wishing you and BC all the best. Again, we'll be in Vegas next week. You're going to get Vegas next week. You know, so we'll see how it goes from there. Who are the fighters with the best and worst tattoos? Best would be uh, Megan Anderson. Worst would be... Oof, that's a tough... That's a tough one. Um... Again, I've got bad tattoos too, so, you know. I mean, the Jamal Hill thing up here is not great, but, you know, like I said, um, i got some bad ones too. Do you think Joe Rogan deserves to be in the UFC Hall of Fame? No, but probably most of you do. Do you know who will Kamaru Usman fight next? Any rumors? No, I've not actually not heard any rumors related to that. Luke, watch Andor, No Jedi. I tried, I liked it, but again, I'm just so fucking sick of the... But the, Okay, there was no Jedi, but you know what it was? It was like, okay, we're the rebellion, we're still fighting the Empire. Guys, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> like, get crushed by the rebellion or don't. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't give a fuck. All right, issues with Acolyte to fans. DEI, I mean, okay. Again, does that mean black people and women? Showrunner was Harvey. Okay, well, that's not great. Was Harvey Weinstein's number one showrunner would lead, would lead with George Lucas isn't end all be all to Star Wars. And some say it looks like a Clone War show. To me, the trailer was just okay. Yeah, I mean, if you got Harvey Weinstein's people up in there, God only knows. But, um, yeah. Max says, Do you ever struggle with academic burnout? I don't, I'm not nearly academic enough to struggle with academic burnout. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. Here we go. Fofo gifting memberships. Fofo gifting memberships. Go get them while you can, suckers. Uh, okay. 
Is Strike Force the most underrated MMA promotion of all time? Probably. It's a tough call with WEC, but but Strike Force was a bigger scale. Yeah, probably. Probably is the answer to that. Yes. I'm trying to think of I mean Ryzen, sorry. Dream, no. Sengoku, no. Smack Girl, obviously no. Um, I still think Cage War is actually pretty underrated, but you're thinking like the most underrated. Yeah, probably Strike Force. When MK. Yvonne, we've been over this. Look at this. Lydian just gifting memberships like a fucking Oprah handing out cars. Thank you, Lydian. I really appreciate you. Luke, first time commenting on any platform. Could you explain the Lloyd Irvin fiasco? Even as a local who has done a deep dive, it's confusing. The basic story is, as I understand it, perhaps there is something else to it that has not been, I've not been revealed to me, but it goes something like this. Um, there were two guys who were training with Lloyd Irvin back, what, what year was this? 20, I don't even remember anymore, 2014, 2015, something like that. I can't remember what it was anymore. There were two guys who were training there that were accused and charged of raping another Lloyd Irvin female student in a parking lot under, I think, St. Matthew's Church, which is um, right at near the corner of Connecticut and Rhode Island Avenue in Northwest D.C., just south of DuPont Circle. Um, there was a trial, and um, the details were harrowing, but ultimately the jury uh, acquitted both of them, which was a surprise to many, including me and uh, many others in the community. Those two guys ultimately ended up leaving the team. And I think one of them actually had another run-in with the law um, uh, in New York City. The other one, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if they ever kind of fell off. But it was in the discovery process that it was sort of found that there were other members of that team who had had other issues related to um, you know similar kinds of crimes like DJ Jackson or similar kinds of issues, I should say. And then it would also was revealed that I think Lloyd Irvin, when he was much, much younger, was also have had some kind of, I, I, I got to be careful because I don't remember the full details, but had also run into some issue where ultimately I think he either, either was exonerated or not charged or only partly implicated. There was certainly no like conviction or jail time related to anything he had done, but you know, was in some way involved and it all kind of came to light all at once. And, um, you know, I was very surprised by just keeping it about what the initial story was about the two guys. I, given the evidence, I was extremely surprised that they were exonerated. But um, but they were. They were exonerated. So, so that's that. It was that two guys getting charged for this incident, all related to the team, brought to light all of these other issues that the team was experiencing or had experienced in different ways at different times. And it was, you know, at the time, I think a really bad look for all involved. Joe says, I spent about a year and a half all throughout Mexico planning my first Columbia trip. There you go. I'll be there for 10 days. What cities are you recommending and why? Uh, I.e. Cali, Barranquilla, uh, Cartagena, Medellin. You spelled Medellin a little bit wrong. So I will tell you this much. Uh, Cartagena is a must. It's the most expensive city in Colombia, but I think by any American standards, it's extremely affordable. It's a must. It's an absolute must. Um, dude, I didn't like Barranquilla. I didn't like it at all. It's as hot as Cartagena, and it's got all the traffic of Bogota. Not for me. Uh, I think Medellin is a must. I think Bogota is a must. And I think some of the countryside as well. Pereira, if you're outside Bogota. Um, the Salt Cathedral at Zipaquira. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can skip Tunja. <laughs> Tunja sucks. Like, my least favorite cities in Colombia so far have been Tunja and Barranquilla. And I know Shakira's from Barranquilla, but, and people who are from Barranquilla are like super proud about it. And they're, apparently they're, uh, apparently they're, um, Carnival is like a big deal. But dude, I, I didn't think it was, they have a river walk there. What do they fucking call it? It's like the Melon, the Melon Con? What do they call the river walk in Barranquilla? I forget the name of it. What the fuck do they call that thing? Ah, the Malacon. They call it the Malacon. Here, I'll show you a picture of it. Mira. This is... Oh, here. Let's do it this way. This is the Riverwalk. Um, 
you know, it looks nice and people go up there and then this is the Magdalena, which is the river in, in there. Um, you can, the Magdalena is accessible actually all the way through Cartagena as well. But, um, I would go, yeah, I would go, go to the coffee zone if you can. Bogota, Medellin, Cartagena. Um, I don't know how Cali is these days. So yeah. Can the US DOJ sue the USC for their monopoly? I don't, I don't. I mean, they can sue whoever they want. Like, will they? I think is a better question. The answer is probably not anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, guys, if you have some kind of hope about any kind of regulatory power rearranging the industry, it's time to bury that. At least for the for a while. It's time to bury that. I mean, maybe someone's planning something. You never know. But I wouldn't count on it. I would say that this was one of the most... This is one of the, the most relevant and powerful challenges to the UFC I'd ever seen and it folded and that's that like that it's it's over you know what I mean back then how big was the UFC on Fox deal for the sport it's hard to appreciate now in retrospect but it was enormous it was enormous it was absolutely fundamentally game changing it changed television because at the time there was the fuel and then the speed channel which got turned into FS1 and F well, FS two and then FS1 respectively. And so there was this vast expansion of sports in general. There was this, um, you know, this, this elevation to a place that you never thought MMA could be. MMA was like, dude, it was, it was grungy and like off the beaten path. And it was like the little engine that could. And then this was this crowning achievement that happened as a consequence. And um, yeah, it was, I don't. I mean, I don't know what the equivalent would be now. I mean, the closest thing would be like moving to Netflix, and that's not quite right either. But something like that. It would, it, you know, really like another level of ascension to pop culture that heretofore has been inaccessible. Uh, yeah. Look at this, Fofo, ha making sure all your kids don't grow. Hit them up, style, handing out five uh, LT memberships. Tyler, welcome to the party, buddy. Appreciate you. All right. Last but not least. Do you expect Tyson versus Paul to be on the level? Yeah, I mean, I don't think these guys are out here committing crimes in broad daylight. I don't think that's what they're happening. I think they're just putting on weird-ass fights, and you get unsatisfying, weird-ass results as a consequence. But I don't think they're out here, like, setting shit up in front of the, of the world to, like, dissect. They're putting on real fights. They're just... When I say real, I mean it's not, like, fixed. It's just the most irregular circumstances you've ever seen all right boys and girls i hope by this time next week we have made our announcement i don't know if we will i really fucking hope i would like to tell you that we will i'd like to tell you that you know let's check my phone hey maybe maybe i've gotten word no i've not gotten word so you know uh i'm waiting on word like you guys are and when we have it, we'll share it. Thank you to all the MK faithful. Thank you for all your patience. Oh, wait, there's one more here. Here we go. Thank you, buddy. And, okay, last one. Did you ever struggle with academic burnout? Uh, yeah, I mean, by the time I, my senior year was over, I didn't want to do any more academic work. But, um, you know, that was pretty short-lived in the end. All right? All right. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate you. If you got any questions, you can email me, lukethomasnews at gmail.com. Shouts to all the new members. Love you. See you next time. And until then.